Welcome back, Quick Brain. Your question for today, and this is going to be a deep, interesting one. How do you overcome your fears of failure and a bonus on lucid dreaming, something people have been asking for for the past two years since I've mentioned it as part of my morning routine? This is your episode, and I'm excited to have a very special guest on the show today. She is a recovering attorney. She is a comedian. She is the host of the Conscious Ish, say that, um, a podcast. Uh, Mia Lux, thank you so much for being Thanks on the show. Thanks for having me, Jim. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for so long. Me too. So I think a lot of our listeners, a lot of our viewers uh, struggle. They've, they've shared with us in our private Facebook group on social media that uh, what's keeping them from progressing in their life to being this kind of limitless state is the fear of looking bad that they want to be perfect and they have the fear of, of failure and so um were you dealing with this yourself yeah and i think it's you know i was reflecting on this and i think it's really important even to differentiate between the fear of failure and perfectionism because mm -hmm. Failing is one thing. Failing is like, oh, you tried something, it didn't even work. Perfectionism is so much worse than that because perfectionism is even doing really well gets you to just, I'm okay. Perfectionism, like I remember my standard for like, did I pass was, did I blow them out of the water? So if I did well, I felt like I was failing. So it wasn't even a oh, fear wow. of failing. It wasn't even like I did it bad. I just didn't do it so sensationally well that everyone was mind blown forever. Mm -hmm. And so that, when you're at that degree of like self-criticism, I mean, you can't win. And so that's why you'll see people who, who, even though you'd be like, but they're doing so well, they're so high achieving, they're so successful, they're not failing, but they're in this like crazy criticism spiral. Like they feel like they're failing because they're so perfectionist about it. So I burned out as a lawyer. I retrained as a high school teacher, worked with kids with learning behavioral difficulties, loved my job, mm -hmm. but worked harder as a teacher than I ever worked as a lawyer. Wow. And, you know, because you do, because I'm like, I'm the, I made all my own curriculum. I made all my own resources. I was yeah. so dedicated. But this, this brain loop of like perfectionism, you know, I'm getting up and I'm doing this work with these kids and then I'm not seeing instant results. Right. I'm like, well, these kids haven't like radically transformed yet. I'm failing. Work harder. Okay. Next day. Still not transformed. I'm failing. Work harder. And, and after That's like 10 cycle. months, it only took 10 months, Jim. And I had like full adrenal fatigue. Like I couldn't mm. get out of bed. I had to resign. It was heartbreaking. And, and, I, and that's when I realized, like, I was like, okay, there's something in me right. that is complete. It's like, this is a monster in me that is destroying me inside out. And so I asked myself, like, I think it's to do with failure. Like, I felt like, and, and failure, not just in the terms of failing. I didn't fail as a lawyer. I didn't actually fail as a high school teacher. I felt like I was failing. So it had to do with perceived failure. And that's something everybody could benefit from this, like, it, when they're on their pursuits, and are you really failing? Are you even failing? Right. Like it's most of the time we're really not even failing. We are failing according to whatever uniquely constructed perceptions we have about where we should be. Right. right. And so. failure and mistakes are, you know, there's, you know, we, we can make mistakes, but mistakes don't have to make us. Correct. Very much so. And, and, the, and, you know, and you'll see people who have a very different models. And that's what I was seeing. I'm looking at other people who are, who are, showing up in a different way they're making mistakes and they're getting up and they're having a great time and i'm doing everything right and getting it right and still feeling like i'm failing so i got there's like there's something broken in my software like some there's some loop that i'm running that is not functional and so i thought okay well if i if i'm going to learn how to fail i don't want to do it intellectually like you can read a book about failure and that's mm -hmm. great but failure feeling like you're failing it's a it's like a feeling in your body it's like a like oh, and so i realized like comedy doing stand-up comedy for me was a way to practice failure because you are triggering it in such a it's extreme and visceral way. Because when you get up on stage in front of people, first of all, public speaking in general, terrifying. Like it's just sure. terrifying, you know, ter terrifying for people. Getting up in front of people and being like, I think I'm really funny and I'm gonna make you laugh adds like 300% pressure, right? And even if you're the best stand up comedian in the world, you will still bomb. Like you cannot do comedy and not fail the vast majority of the time. And when you're learning, you can't do stand-up comedy and not fail 80% of the time. It's a part of it. And so for me, learning to get up and learning to hold that as the, the goal was the process. So I would shift my success criteria to, did I write something I thought funny? 
did I get up and did I perform it? And so what I learned to do was to get up and even though my brain would be screaming at me, like, and even like I'd tell a joke and I, I tell you, there is very few more painful social experiences than being in front of an audience, telling a joke and just silence, just like stone cold faces and silence and, and everything in your body is saying like, you're failing, you're like you're, this is the end of the world. To go through the experience and come out on the other side and be like, like nothing's changed. Like I'm completely okay. Like I'm totally mm, fine. Mm. Like nothing, actually nothing's gone wrong. And I was like, oh, I, it's, like, it's like you survive it. Like, and then you do it again. And every time it's like a desensitization in the brain where, and now my brain doesn't scream at me like that anymore. Now when I'm failing, like if something's not going right, like it doesn't come in that kind of visceral body flood survival mechanism breakdown and and for me comedy was a constructive deliberate intentional way to practice that to activate the feeling in my body and to be with it in what my brain knows is a low stakes scenario like like nothing bad is going to happen right even if you suck and it's just sometimes our biology our nervous system it's hijacked our amygdala feels like there's a saber tooth tiger in the audience and we're reacting that way and you'll but- feel it like you'll feel the heat you you'll sweat like you you'll have those extreme physiological responses. And I think that's a really powerful thing to work through. And the more you desensitize, right. like the less, I, I don't get that anymore. Like sometimes I'll, I'll have like, I'll get like a bit of like, like internal cringe, like right. blood didn't work. But I'm not having this powerful negative physiological response anymore, which is what drove so much of my life before. And that showed up on stage and off stage. Absolutely. So in those situations where maybe you would be prompted or triggered, that conditioning showed up and you have feel more emotionally fit. Yeah. And it's in a situation where you felt like maybe in the past you would need to be perfect or show up, then uh, then you were more resilient. So what would your challenge be for people who are, who are listening right now? Should they, are, are you saying that everybody who's listening who struggles <laughs> with perfectionism and fear of failure should, should sign up? Go to up an open I, mic. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love to take my friends to open mics. So yeah. I, I actually do. I do. I love to do that. I also don't think that's everybody's answer. Right. But, but I think there is something for everybody. There's the, everybody has something in their life, some small, safe, constructive space that they could fail. And I think the trick is to figure out like, what does that look like for you? And really to make failure like the goal, like understanding that whatever you pick, and it could be, for instance, you could just pick something you're not good at. It could be a new sport, something which is going to require time and resilience. Something that's going to be like, okay, well, for the first week of doing this, I'm going to repeatedly fail. Mm. And to be so in and curious and like focus on that experience of being like, huh, what's it going to be like to be, you know, in my 30s or my 40s? And to pick up something that I am like as good as a yeah. five-year-old in. I agree with you that change can't just happen intellectually because that challenge didn't come intellectually through a conversation. So it's hard to fix with the conversation, you know, but getting an experience and, a, and that exactly. creates a metaphor. Now you have another way of dealing with fear that you and I have geeked out about shared experience that our audience have asked about a lot. And so they're going to be very thankful that you're our guest today. One of the ways of dealing and facing your fears is through your dream state. Well, first, let's define this. Yeah, let, let, so let's, and just, I just want to say as well, like I, I am not a lucid dreaming teacher per se. I'm obsessive about it. It's, it's one of the bigger parts of my life. It's the biggest and most impactful spiritual practice I've ever used. Um, <clears throat> I had, I've read a lot about it and I've had the pleasure of working with Charlie Morley, who's been my kind of lucid dreaming guide in this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and why it's so powerful, of course, is that it's you can't, again you can't learn it intellectually it's experiential okay. so let's define yeah. it so lucid dreaming is the is really the the act of being conscious in your dream while dreaming so normally we're in a dream state and we are we don't know that we're dreaming just like we walk through our waking life we don't think about it so much you're in your dream you're like you could be a prince or a princess or this or that and you're just like da 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 and some of us will have this spontaneously where at some point we go wait is this is this a dream and everyone at some point has usually had some kind of experience like this. And usually the brain will try to get you like, nope, it's not a dream. It'll give you like some ridiculous explanation for why there's a flying elephant, right? You're, you're saying that you could also use it to deal with the things that you fear and, and help bring yourself to some resolution. So, I mean, <clears throat> there's so many practices you can do in a lucid dream. And the for me, some of the most powerful ones I found in terms of like really embracing the stuff that I fear is you're, you're 
your brain and your, like I find my, my dreams and my unconscious mind is so symbolic, right? Like it'll, you work with the symbolic imagery of the dream. When you get lucid, it's not like you control the dream. You're not just like, do this dream, do that. But you have a really powerful kind of co-creative influence with the dream in that moment. So for instance, I would like, I would ask to meet the aspects of myself. So like once I asked, I asked to meet the fear, my fear of success. I was at the point where I was just about to release my show and I just hit this like, you know, you talk about mindset, I hit like a limiting belief in my mindset about uh, what it meant to be successful. And I felt like there was something that was holding me back. So in my mm. lucid dream, I said, I said to the dream, uh, I'd like to meet my fear of success. And you do this like before you go to bed or? Yeah, like I like to have a dream plan. Like there's a, there's a real process because dream memory, intentionality, motivation, these mm. are like the biggest things in terms of like getting lucid, staying lucid. You have to learn how to stabilize a dream. You know, it could take about two weeks, sometimes two months sure. to learn how it's, to... It's a skill. It's a skill. And so once you have those basic skills down, then your capacity to interact and call and ask for things, your your your, your mind responds. And so I asked to meet my fear of success and, and out will come a dream figure that embodies it. I can have a conversation and I'll say, well, you know, what is this? And the fear of success is, um, I don't think you're going to be happy if you make it. Successful people aren't happy. Wow. Right? And it's this like very, like, very is it, is nerdy so? woman with a clipboard. Like she has a whole personality. Oh, wow. And she comes out like, and I'm able to have the conversation. And then like the work that Charlie Morley has helped me with is like then to integrate, I hug and I say, I'm sorry, I accept, I integrate you, I love you. And often those dream figures will then like transform and change. In a lucid dream, everything feels as real as real life feels. Like there is everything, you could, there's, there's the touch, This could the be a smell. dream you really get that your your brain is capable of producing the most unbelievably high-tech 3D simulator you've ever stepped into. Like mm -hmm. VR is like nothing. And it can create architecture and sunsets and plants and flowers and people's faces and textures and gravity. And, you're like, and so if, you, if you're someone like me, I have perfectionism. All the little micro fears of my psyche that have been chipping away at me, having a, essentially, a, you know, a, 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 a real... 3D simulator to interact with them and to ask questions and relate to them and heal them. It's, it is the most powerful sort of psychological, spiritual work I think that people can do. Amazing. I love this so much. What would be one tip for somebody who's listening to just begin their first step mm -hmm. into lucid dreaming? I'm, I, I'm sure some people do it naturally. Yes. But I mean, it's, it, there's, there's, it's really you need to dream recall is the biggest thing and it mm -hmm. seems like you already have a show about that so make mm -hmm. sure you watch jim's show dream recall i have a dream journal every day no matter what dream and because you're just training your brain to be like dreams are important but then the other part of it is the reason why we don't wake up in our dreams is because we're so mindless in our lives mm -hmm. and so the the practice i call like reality checks it's like i walk through my life and i and as often as i can i stop and i go is this a dream and then like i literally i do a reality check where this yeah. is really good. I look at my hands. I'll pick one spot on my hand, focus on it, flip my hand, flip it back. In a dream, your brain finds it really hard to replicate your hand perfectly. Right. You'll lose a finger. It won't mm -hmm. look, and that'll, that's why I do a check. Like, am I yeah. dreaming? There's a bunch of different reality checks you can do. So if I get the suspicion I'm dreaming, I'll check. And I, if I do that every, like I do it, try to do it 10, 20 times a day. Like if you really want to like get lucid. Mm -hmm. And you just start doing it in your dreams. You'll find yeah. yourself in your dream talking about lucid dreaming to somebody. Like I've had yeah. dreams where I'm like, yeah, it's this lucid dreaming thing. And then you do this thing, you do this reality check, you do this. And I do it in the dream. And then it, my finger goes, I'm like, oh, wait, I'm dreaming right now. Right, like, exactly. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I think people uh, have have thought about something all day and then yes. they dream about it. Correct. And so training yourself with a simple habit of asking yourself, is this a dream? Is this a dream? Is this a dream? Mindfulness, right, like looking course. at something. And then the first time the answer is yes, then you're you're in a lucid dream because you just probably use that same languaging and that exactly. habit while you're dreaming. Exactly. And, and don't be disappointed like if you get lucid for the first time and what happens is often we get lucid. Mm -hmm. We get so excited, we might just wake up instantly. Like that's right. very normal. Like there's a, there's an art to it, but just the, the thrill of, of getting lucid and and being in your own mind in yeah. this kind of very beautiful, very real way. Uh, it, it is, for anyone who's interested in knowing themselves better, doing healing work, it's, yeah. it's powerful. I would challenge everybody who's watching this right now as, as we come to a close is that, you know, when we're talking about fears, you know, it's often they're not, they're not real. 
and there's something that's maybe learned and to seek out tools and resources whether it is comedy or lucid dreaming or something else to help you to to em embrace it in a way where you're still physically safe um, but you could get acclimated to it and you could see what that fear is actually actually teaching us um, this is amazing I, I would challenge everybody to do this is to take a screenshot of this episode of this video and tag Mia tag myself on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or all those social media fancy things and share uh, I, I'm curious what maybe have you experienced a lucid dream before is this something that you've done and share that on social media you know and um, for our favorites I will uh, I'll actually repost them so how, how do people find, get more information about right, well, what if, you're doing? Well, yeah, so my show, The Conscious Is Show, it's like a late night comedy style show, but with personal growth. And there's actually an episode with Charlie Morley on Lucid Dreaming. Uh, we do an extended interview about uh, really going to the spiritual aspects and also like a how to actually get there. And so you can find that at consciousish.com or on Instagram, you know, at consciousish. And, uh, and that, yeah, so season one is completely up now and it's free. It's a digital Amazing. show and, and uh, it's it's... It's the lighter side, like learning to laugh at some of the, some of the most profound, also most challenging parts of our lives. Yeah, this is true. And I, I, I can't uh, recommend it highly enough because part of it is bringing comedy into meditation and eating that diet and all the topics that you discuss, which is, which is in a way hilarious. Um, I'll put, of course, all the links uh, to uh, your social media and to your show at jimquick.com forward slash notes in the show notes and uh mia thanks for being on thanks man. Brian, it's your brain coach i want to thank you so much for watching this video three things to do number one make sure you share this because when you teach something you get to learn it twice update your learning so you can update other people's learning as well number two make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a thing because if you miss a video you miss a lot and finally make sure you hit that bell so you're notified and you find out when we put out the latest and the greatest one one extra thing, if you want really close attention, then text me. Here is my phone number, 310-299-9362. Did you remember that number? 310-299-9362. Shoot me a text and we'll stay in touch. Ask me your burning question. And I wish your days be full lots of life, lots of love, lots of laughter, and always, Lots of learning. I'll see you in our next video.